Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Shauna Smith along with Dave Briggs. Let's get you up to speed on today's market action. Very different picture than what we were looking at yesterday. Taking a look at the Dow, now off 155 points, so off the lows of this session, but giving back some of the gains that we saw uh, yesterday. NASDAQ starting the new month of December up just around three tenths of a percent. S&P slightly holding on to gains up just about two points right now as we kick off the final hour trading. Russell 2000 in the red today off just around two tenths of a percent. Digging, digging into some of the individual movers that we are seeing this afternoon. If you take a look at some of the big tech names, it certainly is a mixed picture. You have Amazon off just around one percent. Tesla also in the red today, but you do have Apple, Microsoft, Google, Nvidia, Meta holding on to gains. Taking a look at the Dow, the worst performer in the Dow is Salesforce. We are looking at a drop of just around 8%. That This follows the news that we got out yesterday after their earnings report. Also the fact that their co-CEO, Brett Taylor, will be stepping down in January. And real quick, let's take a look at the sector action because a bit of a mixed picture here. Communication services, technology leading the way, but real estate, financials, consumer staples among the worst performers, Dave. Great stuff. Thank you, Shauna. Let's catch up to speed now on some breaking news out of the Fed. The Chicago Federal Reserve announcing Austin Goolsby, friend of the show, will be the next president of the regional bank, replacing Charles Evans, who will retire in January. Goolsby has been a professor at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business for 28 years and, of course, served in the Obama administration as chairman of the White House Council of Economic Advisors. Goolsby will be a voting member of the FOMC next year. All right, let's get you up to speed on an important inflation indicator. Prices measured by the PCE index, that is the Fed's preferred inflation reading, showing the signs of slowing last month. Prices rose by 6% on an annual basis through October. That's down from its previous jump of 6.3% in September. Core PCE, which strips out food and energy, that rose two tenths of a percent on a monthly basis in October, slightly below Wall Street expectations. This is the latest sign that inflation pressures could potentially be moderating. All right, let's get you up to speed now on U.S. manufacturing data. Activity contracted last month, falling for the first time in over two years, according to the Institute for Supply Management. Manufacturing PMI, meanwhile, falling to 49, the first contraction and weakest reading since May 2020. You hear a lot about that date. Why? Because, of course, the early days of COVID, a scary sign. Higher interest rates, no doubt, impacting the sector with still another 50-point hike lightly at the December meeting in just about 10 days. Shauna? All right, well, let's make sense of today's market action. Also, what we could expect in the final month of the year for that. We want to bring in eToro USA investment analyst Callie Cox. Callie, it's great to have you on the program again. So we're looking at losses at least for the Dow, coming off what was a very strong gain yesterday of over 700 points. How do you think this sets us up as we head into the final month of the year, because like you noted in your notes, S&P now back above the 200 day moving average. Yeah, I mean, I think we're you know struggling a little bit today, but we have to look at that in the context of where we've come since mid-October. I mean, Dow stocks, the economically sensitive stocks have led the market higher and we're basically realizing now that the Fed could maybe pull this off. And, you know, we might be moving into the next step of policy and the Fed is willing to be flexible, uh, even though, or even as we see inflation go through some progress and, you know, the economy you know, soften a little bit, but avoid those recessionary, that recessionary death, if you will. So, you know, I think we're processing a lot right now, but I think it's a lot of good news. Investors are just trying to understand how good it is because rates are still high and we're not quite out of it. And Kelly, we're still processing whatever happened yesterday with the markets essentially putting on the earmuffs and skyrocketing after the Fed told us exactly what they've been signaling for months now. Have you processed that? What do you make of it? Oh, I've processed that because Powell <laughs> basically said what he's been saying for a bit now. He did give us a timeline, though. He did say that rate hikes could start slowing in the next couple of weeks at their next meeting. So I think the market really hinged on that. I think it saw, you know, an element of certainty in there. And then, you know, we saw some position switching, some short covering, and suddenly we were up 3%. Um, I don't think a lot uh, a lot of newer uh, details came out of what Powell said. And I'm struggling to understand why markets are rallying, rallying so much if we're seeing more of a shift than a pivot from the Fed. I mean, the Fed has been very clear that rate hikes aren't coming anytime soon unless something breaks 
we don't want that to happen. So I think markets could struggle here. They're above you know, the important 200-day moving average, but at the same time, we're not under the woods here, and we're in for what could be an environment of high rates for months to come. Yeah, Kyle, you're saying that markets could potentially struggle here. Goldman, Deutsche Bank, both saying that U.S. equities are in for a wild ride next year. What does this mean then for investors in terms of how they should be positioned? Well, I think investors really need to be focused on quality here. It may make sense to sow the, the seeds for the next bull market, and we may even be in a young bull market right now. But at the same time, it may not be you know, the chance to dive back into risk and speculation. I mean, we've been telling our customers that cash management quality financials are key when you're looking at risk right now. You know, Take a look at quality risk with the emphasis on quality, because as rates stabilize, as you know, rates possibly come down in the latter half of the year, we could see more of those rate sensitive sectors tick up and those cyclicals tick up. But at the same time, a high rate environment is a tough operating environment to be in. So you may not see all stocks survive it. Yeah, when we woke, we were in bull market territory, at least in the Dow. I think the S&P was 17 percent up since its lows and, the, and even the Nasdaq up 14 percent from its year lows. Uh, J.P. Morgan today uh, trimmed their earnings forecast for the S&P by 9 percent and also said they think we could retest the lows of 34.91 in the first quarter of 23. Do you agree with that assessment? You know, I don't have a crystal ball. I say that all the time. But I think for us to retest the lows, we're going to need to, to see some recessionary evidence from either earnings or the job market or both. It seems like markets are squarely in the for avoiding a recession camp. And, you know, frankly, economic data is turning that way, too. So I'm not sure if we're quite out of the woods yet here. And, you know, we, inflation is still quite high. The Fed has a little bit more work to do in terms of you know, softening demand to get that down. But, you know, it looks it looks like we'll avoid it. But at the same time, if we see earnings crumble, if we see the job market crumble, we could see that new low start to be priced in. Kelly, speaking of the job market, we certainly are starting to see signs that job growth is cooling here in the U.S., but the levels are still clearly well above what we would likely need to see or what the Fed has indicated we would need to see in order to get inflation under control. What are you expecting to see tomorrow? And I guess, how do you think that picture looks out or looks as we look out into 2023? Yeah, so the job market is a weird one right now. The leaders that you typically see weaken before you see hiring and the unemployment rate weakening aren't budging. Uh, I think about initial jobless claims is the big one. Uh, we're not really seeing a lot of uh, claims for unemployment benefits or those claims tick up, which is great news. You don't want to see unemployment tick up in normal times. But in the context of the Fed fighting inflation, you may have to see a bit of bit more softness in the job market to feel like we can get to a point where inflation is under control. Uh, that being said, tomorrow, uh, you know, everything still looks quite strong. I mean, job openings are still quite high. Company earnings are strong. You know, claims are low. I wouldn't be shocked to see another somewhat moderate pace of hiring in November in the data that we get tomorrow. Uh, you know, I think the details really matter there. But, you know, thinking about the headline number, I don't see much change there. What about the, the spread between the 10 and the 2? We've seen a lot of movement there. No shortage of emphasis on every word coming from Jerome Powell's. Not as much on the 10 and the 2 and, and the spread there. What do you make of it? What does it tell you is around the corner? Yeah, so the yield curve has a lot of historical precedents for predicting recessions, but it flickers quite a bit. Um, we get some false alarms from it. And you know, the context might be a little bit different this time around, which I know is the most dangerous phrase in finance, but I think it's worth considering what environment we're in at the moment. I mean, ever since we saw 10-year yields peak, we've seen economically sensitive stocks rally, you know, 14 to 15% if you look at the Dow. So I look at the yield curve, I see those conflicting signals where st the stock market is basically saying we're avoiding a recession. And I see the yield curve as maybe showing the Fed that it's time to lay off the rate hikes, maybe slow down the rate hikes, pause here and see the collateral damage around them. Um, you know, maybe I'm an optimist here, but I do think that, you know, this period is a little strange for the yield curve and the bond market is processing a lot of mixed signals. It sure is a little strange. Hard to read. Callie Cox, great to see you. Thanks so much. We are just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up, Sam Bankman-Fried has been telling his side of the FTX collapse. We'll separate fact from fiction, or we'll at least try to. The long-awaited Tesla semis are finally hitting the road. We'll tell you 
all about them. And we get more clues on the state of retail when Ulta Beauty reports its third quarter earnings. We'll have those numbers and analysis as soon as they come out. Don't go away. I wasn't spending any time or effort trying to manage risk on FTX. Trying like, and that that obviously that's that a was stunning a admission. What? That's a pretty stunning admission. Yeah, I mean, it, I don't know what to say. Like, what happened happened, and like, if I had been, if I had been spending an hour a day thinking about risk management on FTX, I don't think that would have happened. I think I, I stopped working as hard for a bit. You know, honestly, if I look back on myself. I think I got a little cocky, I made more than a little bit. Wow, to the utter amazement of the financial and legal community in George Stephanopoulos, the SBF Redemption Tour continues today as the founder of now bankrupt FTX took to GMA to explain his role in the collapse of his crypto exchange. The Wall Street Journal's Gregory Zuckerman has been covering the SBF downfall and joins us now with his takeaways. Gregory, good to see you. Uh, this is going to give you a blank slate here. Your reaction to the last 24 hours, has he helped himself at all and what stands out to you most? You know, it's a little bit like the uh, George Costanza defense or strategy. I don't know if you know the episode of Seinfeld, doing everything I do. you wouldn't think logical <laughs> and rational. Um, but normally in these cases, you lawyer up, you don't talk to the media. I mean, as a member of the media, we're appreciating it, uh, but it's not necessarily a traditional uh, approach. Might it work, this unorthodox approach? Uh, it, it might, but it seems um, like he is... Blaming, taking blame, um, not all the blame. He's shifting blame as well. So on the one hand, he's saying, I messed up, which is, I guess, kind of nice to hear if you're an investor, I suppose. But he's also kind of saying others are the ones who did the key uh, um, criticism, the key, the key issue here is shifting cash from FTX to Alameda, FTX, the exchange, the crypto exchange, to Alameda, the trading firm. And he's saying, 
I'm blameless there. So on the one hand, he's owning up to, to culpability. On the other hand, he's pointing the finger at his colleagues. Hey, Gregory, you've talked to SBF recently. You've also talked to a number of former employees. And you had a recent piece in the journal talking about some of those conversations, saying that years before this collapse, a group of employees quit because of his approach to risk. What can you tell us about those conversations and what you learned? Yeah, that was kind of startling in that some of the very issues that we're focusing on today, the lack of risk controls, accounting, commingling of cash, not paying attention to all these types of dangers, they, they were all identified uh, years ago in 2017, early on at Alameda and till the spring of 2018, senior employees, colleagues of Sam Bankman-Fried pointed the finger at him and said, you're, you're, you're doing this the wrong way. You're not adopting proper risk control, just sort of basic stuff. And he was dismissive of those concerns. So to me, you can't really make some argument that, geez, uh, I wish I'd known better. Again, another George Costanza reference there. Who, who am I? Hi, hi. Had I known, I would have been prepared. You can't really say that because you were warned years ago, according to, as you see from our article. More Costanza references, the better, Gregory. Okay, <laughs> Seinfeld fan here, big one. Uh, the two things that stood out to me, didn't knowingly commingle funds, and I did not ever try to commit fraud. Is that possible given all the things you've reported and have learned about the collapse of FTX and the intermingling of itself? Yeah, it's possible. Um, I'm open to the argument that they were a bunch of young, um, um, not very savvy, uh, um, not really financially sound trader types who got in over their heads. Um, there, there's a possibility of that, but you also, you don't want to say that. And I don't want to suggest that they're not culpable and they're not, and, and that they're blameless. They clearly are. You can't start this exchange and take customers money. They get customers from over, over the world. Some of them smaller, obviously many of them bigger. And then they told these customers that we will not use your cash in our trading uh, elsewhere, in our trading uh, shop, uh, our sister trading shop, Elevator, or elsewhere. And they did so. And frankly, I don't think the interviews so far have really focused on that enough. At the end of the day, they did something that they promised they would not do. That and they, they, they meaning Sam Bankman Freed. So yes, did he take his eye off of the ball as he's saying to every journalist out there, including you know my, myself? Y yes. And um, is, does he seem like a nice enough guy? He, he could be. And, and I do really believe, honestly, that he and his colleagues were trying to give away a lot of money. And they get some credit for that. They didn't, in the end, give away too much. But that, that was the goal. By the end of the day, they did, they seemingly, allegedly did something that they promised they would not do. And they need to be held accountable. Well, Gregory, I want to pull up a tweet that we did get from SBF this morning, following up on the deal book questions that SBF faced with Andrew Sorkin yesterday. And he said, expanding on deal book when I filed, I'm fairly sure FTX US was solvent and that all U.S. customers could be made whole, to my knowledge. It still is today, to my knowledge, I think is key to point out there. I was expecting that to happen. I'm surprised it hasn't. I'm not sure why U.S. withdrawals were turned off. What do you make of his argument just in terms of the state of FTX when it did file for bankruptcy and what you think we'll likely see in the coming weeks, months, potentially years? Yeah, it could be years. This case is going to go on for a long time. Um, it feels like he's trying to make a distinction between FTX US and, and, and the other part of the company, the customers elsewhere in the world. And I can't, guess he's kind of saying, hey, you fellow Americans, you should be fine. We should be able to get your money back. It's not my fault. Don't blame me, my fellow Americans and everybody else. I, I'm not really as concerned or focused or I acknowledge that they may have lost everything. I don't know. To me, um, you, you've made a blanket uh, statement to to your customers and you need to be held accountable for um, misleading them in terms of or, or allegedly misleading them. One of the remarkable things here is that he was the one pushing regulation in D.C., regulation that might have sniffed this out well before it actually collapsed. And you point that on your reporting that that's ultimately what broke him and formed a lot of enemies. So there was a, a hearing today on Capitol Hill on crypto. Um, did anything come out of it? Do you expect Congress to find regulation in the months ahead? And, and any theories why he was actually on Capitol Hill pushing for regulation? 
So it's a tricky thing now for members of Congress. Do you embrace uh, a law rule changes that Sam Bankman Freed had proposed, had been a, a fan of, and some of them seemingly are, are, are good ideas. So they're in a kind of a caught in a tough position. Why did he, uh, was he a proponent of regulation? You can be cynical about it and skeptical and say, well, he was trying to freeze out his competitors. He was the second largest exchange. He already had the market share. There were reasons why he and FTX would prosper even with these um, new regulations. And frankly, um, he if you buy his argument that he didn't realize that what uh, what had been happening, that they were taking money from their customers elsewhere, that potentially could be the, the explanation for why he was a proponent of, of more regulation because he didn't realize how bad things were at his company. But I also don't want to um, come off as, as naive or in, in any way um, – suggesting that he's he's uh, blameless here by not knowing. That's not a good enough explanation um, to say, hey, I, I didn't know this, this was going on. It was his company. And Greg, you're speaking of the potential fallout of this, what that could look like if we don't see more regulation or really just a result of FTX collapsing. We've already seen a couple of bankruptcies, BlockFi filing for bankruptcy earlier this week, citing their exposure to FTX. When you try to, I guess, gauge the contagion of this, what the potential fallout is going to look like. What do you see? Well, I have to say, in some ways, I'm very reassured in that uh, it hasn't really infected or affected TradFi, as we call traditional finance. Um, look at the stock market. It's been doing nicely last few days. The economy is, is doing what it's doing. Um, so you could argue that those crypto bros were always in their own world, and in the end, they blew up, and it didn't really affect the real world. Uh, I would also argue, though, that it has having tremendous effect on all kinds of people within this world, and it's an enormous world, as, as you suggest, for a lot of people that have left traditional finance and other kinds of jobs for the crypto world. And of course, there are investors in this world. And yeah, Bitcoin is stabilized around $17,000, but it's down a, a, a ton, and there's a lot of pain there. So I don't want to minimize um, the pain that 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 is being felt out there. Well, certainly a lot of people lost a lot of money with FTX's collapse. Gregory Zuckerman of The Wall Street Journal, great to have you. Thanks so much for joining us. Great to be here. Well, coming up, parents are still struggling with the baby formula shortage. We'll give you the latest on when supply will fully return when we come back.
Much like inventory levels, good housing news, and very short supplies of late. Home buyers got just that today, though, with mortgage rates falling yet again. Freddie Mac now says the average 30-year fixed sits at 6.49%. That's down from 6.58 one week ago. Rates have now seen the biggest three-week drop since 2008. The 30-year was north of 7 on November 10th. Of course, this all depends upon your perspective. Rates were still more than double the 3.11 of one year ago. High mortgage rates have put potential buyers off of their searches, and it's impacting mortgage employees, as you might expect. Wells Fargo cutting hundreds of its mortgage workers today, according to Bloomberg. The bank has already let go of thousands of its employees this year, and it's not the only one. J.P. Morgan cut hundreds of home lending staff back in June. The cuts all on impact of the Fed's fight to tame inflation. And Shana, this is a lot like much of the layoffs we've seen, even in the tech sector, uh, to, to draw a parallel. They overhired during the pandemic mm -hmm. because, of course, they had to. And now they're really trimming the fat from being bloated during COVID. Yeah, then that's very important to point out. I think the question here is how long it's going to take for the real estate market to correct and what this means for home prices. Because yes, mortgage rates, they've come back a bit. They're still extremely high, especially compared to what we saw just a year ago, two years ago. Home prices have also remained high, still up 10% in the month of, a month of September from a year ago. So we yeah. need to see a little bit more of a correction there in order to see that demand really return to the market. Pantheon was out with a note earlier this week saying that they expect existing home prices to drop by about 20% from their June peak levels. Goldman was out. They revised their outlook for home prices from roughly flat next year to down 4%. We see affordability a massive issue, and that's being that's affecting where people are buying, where people are looking. There was a Redfin report out saying that about a quarter of home buyers are now looking at places, metro areas that you that they wouldn't necessarily mm -hmm. have considered in the past because they want to find somewhere that's affordable and somewhere that makes sense for their family now, given the high home prices and also just inflation, really every aspect of their life has been getting more expensive. Yeah, and, and basically every number has been negative. Pending home sales down about 5%, existing home sales, I think 6%. But a big but here is the number you gave, 10% up yeah. over a year ago. And yes, I think they'll drop in people I talk to another three, four, five percent in the next year. But that still leaves you with a pretty healthy gain, unless of course you bought at the peak of the pandemic. But you're probably not selling your home if in fact that's the case. So I don't see that 20 20% yeah. correction ahead. But yeah, because you locked in much lower rates. rates again are falling pretty precipitously. There. All right. Well, one of the biggest suppliers of baby formula has a grim warning for parents. Reckitt Benkeiser, maker of the brand Enthamil, saying that formula shortage will likely persist until the spring. That's according to a report from Reuters. Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kimlani joins us now with the details. Anand, what can you tell us as to why this is still the case? Well, Shauna, unfortunately, even the despite the fact that the U.S. government uh, put in a lot of effort, including uh, enacting the Defense Production Act, as well as relaxing uh, regulations, the FDA allowing more foreign export to come in uh, of companies that hadn't previously been in the market, all of that still leading to a shortage. Wreck it, as you know, uh, maker of the Mead Johnson brand, and uh, now accounting for 50 percent of the baby formula market uh, is leading this and still has not been able to meet, despite increased production, a full shelf. And that's sort of where they're looking at is whether or not the shelves are fully stocked and not emptying out as frequently as they were before. As you saw on your screen, other makers uh, like Gerber as well as Perigo, which is another one that does uh, sort of white label brands for Walmart and Amazon. Meanwhile, Abbott, the reason why this shortage is still in effect, was previously 40% and the market leader has lost ground to wreck it since a recall last year or earlier this year rather of its baby formula as a specialized formula that uh, was contaminated in Michigan plants and had to be recalled. That has really been an ongoing problem. And despite the fact that that plant had has restarted since, uh, it still hasn't led to the level of production and level of supply uh, that uh, the country needs. And so despite the fact that the, the FDA continues to allow imports from abroad, it still isn't meeting demand. Yeah, and I've been buying a lot of baby formula over the last several months, and it's still very, very hard to find. 
sometimes. Anjali Kamlani, thanks so much. All right, well, coming up next, Costco shares sliding today off just around 6.5%. The move lower on weaker than expected sales numbers. We've got more for you when we come back. Time for a triple play. Three stocks that we're watching in the final 30 minutes of trading. Blackstone, AMC, and Costco are our picks today. So let's kick it off with Blackstone, my pick. It's a top trending ticker on Yahoo Finance. The company is limiting withdrawals from its $69 billion real estate fund. This follows a big jump in redemption requests. Now, in a letter posted to its website, Blackstone wrote that redemption requests were above the 5% quarterly limit that is set for the fund. That sent shares down by more than 10% in earlier trading, the biggest drop that we've seen for Blackstone since March. Another big headline that we're keeping a close track on for Blackstone today, the Wall Street Journal reporting that the company has agreed to sell its 49.9% stake in MGM Grand Las Vegas and also Mandalay Bay. They're selling that to Vici Properties. The transaction values the two hotels at $5.5 billion. Jared, that's expected to close in the first quarter of next year. But the big driver for the stock today and why, why we saw a more than 10% drop earlier today was the fact that they are limiting withdrawals from their large real estate fund. Close the gates. That's yeah. what they're doing. And that's what happens when you need a little bit more liquidity for yourself and not necessarily for investors. But that's all right. Nothing, uh, nothing foul there. Let's take a look at the Wi-Fi Interactive. We're going to plot quickly. This is a two-year chart. You can see firmly in a downtrend here, uh, pretty well defined. And uh, that's about all I got to say. Lots of charts uh, in this market environment happen to look like this. So interesting to see what private equity is up to. A little bit of a, a veil there. But now I want to move on to meme stock. Says my play is a blast from the meme friendly past AMC Entertainment. Let me pull this up. Up 14% today after several volatility trading halts. And that's on news that, uh, guess what, guys? There is no news. This is a meme stock. Come on. Just kidding. Uh, yeah, you know, we're in rally mode. To, uh, S&P 500 is over the 200-day moving average. And so why not? A day late and uh, $20 in the uh, green here. 
Uh, but we can see over the last year, still mired in the bottom uh, portion of its range. And let me pull up a three-year chart. This is going to show us the meme frenzy, and you can really see um, that is not the Blackstone chart. Uh, that is a little bit more <laughs> dire there. I, I, in, in all fairness here, is this, uh, does this have any predictive power about the markets, uh, the fact that everything is kind of moving up right now? I mean, we did see this uh, what, late in the August highs. So some people are saying, well, when money's late to the mean stocks, maybe that's a, that's a contrary signal. I think there's more at play here, but it's fun to talk about. And hey, uh, meme stocks perking up, always going to grab some headlines. And try to make sense of Bed Bath & Beyond up 6.7% <laughs> Still on today that one. Because it, we, we learned that 40% of their goods were out of stock ahead of Black Friday. We learned that they had dismal Black Friday sales. So it only makes sense to see Bed Bath & Beyond surging today. Forget it, there is no news here. Wall Street bets well done. Cost is my play. Costco, of course, shares sliding today on news of weaker than expected November sales. Costco said sales ending November 27th, which included Black Friday, rose 5.7% to $19.17 billion. That's though a sharp decline from the 7.7% increase in October and the 10% increase in September. That echoes what we heard from Target CEO Brian Cornell recently saying he saw consumers begin to change their behavior, quote, working with their budget, shopping very carefully, looking for value. And that's what we saw really across those five days between Thanksgiving and uh, Cyber Monday. Costco may have also suffered, though, from the 30% decline in gas prices we've seen recently. They will report earnings one week from today on the 8th. Expectations for 3 bucks 12 cents per share on 53.92 billion shares of Costco, as you can see, down 6.6% on this and down 10% this year. Pretty good indicator of the economy of the consumer, Sean. Yeah, it's certainly a worrisome sign, especially since Costco has been able to weather a lot of the volatility that we've seen yeah. prior to November. So the drop there will be very interesting to hear, uh, to wait to see what we do hear from the company when they do report earnings next week. Online sales, though, Dave, I wanted to point it out, a 10% decline in e-commerce sales for Costco during that period. So another sign just in terms of consumers pulling back their spending, inflation prices remaining very, very high. And as the economy certainly seems like it's continuing to weaken. This could be a worsen sign here, just in terms of what we could see over the next couple of months. All right, well, coming up next here on Yahoo Finance, Tesla getting set to unveil its new semi-trucks. We'll tell you all about them and find out why prospective car buyers have reason for optimism in 2023. Stay tuned.
right, let's check out shares of Tesla trading. Just about level, but down a pinch today on some rather big news. Big in terms of size, anyway. The EV maker will unveil its 18-wheeler semi at a factory in Nevada tonight, and PepsiCo will receive the first delivery of Tesla semis tonight. This all comes after a three year delay. Yahoo Finance's senior autos reporter, Proud Supermanian, joins us with the details. What do we know about this big boy? You know, it'll be the first time seeing it, the production version in the flesh here, this 18-wheeler uh, semi-truck, as they call it. Uh, it should possibly, um, we're hearing that it'll have around 500 miles of range, which is very impressive, towing 80,000 pounds, which is the max weight that a Class 8, I guess, vehicle can tow. So, very impressive stats. We'll get the official, hopefully get the official numbers later tonight when at the reveal event in Giga, Nevada. Uh, and they said PepsiCo will be the first uh, recipient of these trucks. They're going to use them in their feudal lay facility in Modesto. So they're going to be kind of rejiggering that facility to, to kind of deal with electric trucks and those big kind of semis as well. So uh, a big night for Tesla here. But I think there's some concern or some kind of, you know, skepticism if this thing can actually do that for the right price. Yeah, <laughs> Let alone if the question. power grid can support them. Yeah, yeah. then that's yeah. another big factor in all this. Uh, Press, there was also a couple of headlines crossing today just in terms of Tesla adjusting their prices on a couple of models in an effort to boost demand. Why are they doing this now? Yeah, I mean, it, it looks concerning on the face of right? cutting prices. Electric reporting that they're sending out dealer notices to cut the Model Y Model 3 price by 3500 bucks each in the month of December to kind of boost deliveries in this month because of the fact that they're concerned or they're seeing people canceling orders because they want to get that IRA uh, tax credit that starts again for, for Tesla in January. So they're saying, hey, we'll give you half that credit now if you get this truck now or get this car now. So that's the kind of the reason behind it because they don't have a backlog of cars sitting on their lots in December uh, when their numbers come out for Q4 deliveries. They want to get those cars out the door and restart it again in January uh, for Q1. And I think the semi has a $40,000 Tax yeah. break, yeah. Uh, so that's a Which big is a one. huge, big huge incentive, incentive there. Huge, and that's yeah. why we saw Elon Musk say, "Hey, we got that that truck coming soon, December first. You know, we're, that right. came out of nowhere." So, uh, all right, we'll see. I don't know. I guess it'll be entertaining. But it always is. Unveils are always it entertaining. Always so we'll we'll see. Real quick, there might be a surprise. So we'll see. There's there's. What do you a, think that will be? I might might hear some news about the new that Tesla Roadster, that supercar that they had they had teased a while ago. Mm. We'll see. Good we'll see. tease, brother. We'll see. Okay, Good we'll tease. see what we hear. All right, Pras, thanks so much for having on set. For as we want to stick with cars of the auto sector, average prices for new and used cars, they're up on a year-over-year -year basis. New car prices up over 3% since just a year ago. They've been plagued by supply chain issues. And the Fed's fight to get inflation under control has caused interest rates on vehicles to skyrocket. Our next guest, though, sees some signs of hope on the horizon in terms of inventory and pricing. We want to bring in Jessica Caldwell, Edmonds Executive Director of Insights. Jessica, it's great to see you again. So why should we be optimistic in terms of what we'll likely see over the coming months? Well, if there's anybody out there that has been trying to buy a car for the past few months and either can't find one, not getting the selection that they want, or just appalled by some of the prices that they have been seeing, we are seeing inventory get a little bit better from the supply crunch. And that has had real, a real effect on prices. Prices getting a little friendlier. I'm hearing people are getting calls back from dealers saying, hey, we have that vehicle rather than never hearing back again. Um, and we knew this was going to happen. We knew that there would be a turning point at some point. So not everything is back to where it was pre-COVID but we are seeing climbing inventory numbers for the past few months versus the falling ones that we have been seeing. So I feel like there is finally light at the end of the tunnel for people shopping for a car. Just zooming in there on the supply chains, how, how much are they improving? The chip shortage given the China COVID lockdowns, what's been the impact there? And if I could tag on used car prices, what are we seeing there? Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, used car prices are still relatively high. At the end of the year, we typically see them fall a little because these are used vehicles, so they're getting a little bit older. So every month they technically should be falling, but there still is a lot of demand. I think what's hurting both new and used are interest rates right now. We know that the Fed has been raising interest rates. And for used, that really does have a profound impact because people are paying regular interest rates. They're not necessarily getting any subsidies from automakers in the form of incentives. And although they're not generous on the new car side, it still makes a difference if you're getting 4% per se versus 7%, especially if you're financing these uh, you know, vehicles that are you know, upwards of $50,000. It will make a bit of a difference. Yeah, Jessica, JP Morgan's predicting a plunge of up to 20% in used car prices next year compared with a maximum of a 5% dip in new car prices. Is that in line with what you're expecting to see over the next 12 months? 
We still see that there is going to be a lot of demand for used cars. Um, I don't know about such a drastic dip in prices because the thing about it is that the used supply is definitely under a lot of pressure. We didn't see a lot of rental vehicles being sold during the pandemic or through the supply crunch. A lot of people are opting to buy out their leases at the end of their at the end of their term. So those vehicles aren't going back into the used supply. So I think while used prices could get friendlier to consumers, the supply of used cars is what's going to prevent it really from taking a drastic plunge. Got some big numbers in today uh, from some foreign automakers. Want to zoom in on three in particular, Hyundai, 43% pop, Kia 25, Mazda 31%. How do you account for that type of rise? Mm -hmm. Well, the South Korean automakers have been doing fairly well through this uh, supply crunch. Um, I do think that if you look back to where they were last November, you're not necessarily looking at a really tough comp. You're pairing year to year, and that was not yeah. a great time for the auto industry. So this improvement that we are seeing inventory is allowing these numbers to get better. But I will say for particularly for Hyundai and Kia, they have really come out on a product offensive. Their SUVs are hitting the right note. They've had a lot of success with EVs, the Hyundai Ioniq 5, hard to get out there for consumers. Um, so I, while I think they're getting better from inventory, they're also seeing a lot more demand for consumers, which inevitably are gonna help these numbers. Jessica, let's talk about Tesla because we were just talking about it with Praz uh, earlier in the show. But S&P Global Mobility out with the report saying that Tesla is still a top selling EV brand in the U.S., but more affordable rivals are starting to chip away at their dominance in terms of market share. What do you think this means just in terms of Tesla's future here in the U.S. and who should they be most worried about? Yeah, I mean, up until this point, Tesla has been the big fish in a relatively small pond. They got a lot of cachet from being kind of the first, very bold, very brash. Um, maybe now, uh, with go well, that's going on on Twitter, I think that may be kind of um, hurting them just a little bit. But all of a sudden now we have multiple automakers coming out with more compelling, interesting EVs with great range. And these automakers are long established. They have big marketing budgets. They have databases and rosters of consumers they can contact for these vehicles. So the competition is starting to heat up a, a little bit. And I think, you know, for Tesla, they've just been alone in this pool for so long that, of course, this is going to greatly affect them, especially as vehicles. They're a bit old. I mean, they've had some technology updates, but if you look at a Model 3 and Model S, it doesn't look all that different from five, you know, five plus years from when these vehicles came out. So it definitely feels like it's time for the brand to get a bit more refresh. And they're not just getting the just kind of riding that wave of anyone that's interested in EV don't really have a lot of options because that is starting to change. And Jessica, it's December 1st. We start seeing those ads where people have a giant ribbon on a car because, of course, <laughs> everyone buys their spouse a car for Christmas. You have a couple of tips for us quickly on if you are shopping for a car at the holidays. Yeah, that's right. One thing we are talking about right now a lot is definitely shop the interest rate. It's so much fun to shop for a vehicle. I mean, who doesn't like that? Who doesn't want the big red ribbon, right? But <laughs> the interest rate is becoming so much more important. So not only should you get pre-approved, look at what interest rates are out there, maybe from your credit union, maybe from banks, from the automakers themselves, the dealers, but also really do the math. If you have an interest rate that is perhaps a, a bit lower, but um, the vehicle price is a little bit more, and maybe it kind of works out to be a bit moot. Um, also consider perhaps a lower loan term. I know that's painful to think about a car paying it off in three to four years, but if you can get a much lower APR for that range versus extending it to six, seven years, which is very common, um, try to do that as possible, but really uh, focus and hone in on that financial element of it, because I think right now it's, it's really important and it's easy to overlook. All right, Edmonds, Jessica Caldwell, good to see you. Thanks for the tips. Appreciate that. All right, some breaking news now. The Supreme Court will be ruling on President Biden's student loan forgiveness plan. The high court will hear full oral arguments in February. That could produce a final ruling by June. But until then, the administration's plan will remain on hold. After the forgiveness plan was halted, the administration extended the pause on federal student loan debt payments, which were supposed to go back into effect January 1st. Coming up, more Netflix subscribers will reportedly have a voice when it comes to the streaming giant's content. Stick around for the details.
Netflix looking to expand its Preview Club program. This is according to a report from the Wall Street Journal. Now, the program is giving some lucky subscribers the chance to give feedback on the streaming giant's content. Yahoo Finance's Ali Canal has more on this story. Ali, an interesting move here from Netflix. Very interesting. So the Preview Club, this started more than a year ago, and 2,000 or so subscribers would give feedback on content. And now, according to this Wall Street Journal report, they want to expand that to tens of thousands of subscribers by early next year. And interesting that the journal noted, don't look up, I don't know if you guys saw that movie, but they said that they I did, presented actually. this movie to subscribers, and the initial feedback was that it was too serious. So they upped the comedic tone and if you've seen it you know it's very funny so I wonder what it was like before this but Hang on, they changed the tone of a film? yes yes th th this is how important it is a very it's funny film so I actually exactly. appreciate that feedback because I, I liked it I appreciated it too and I think this just speaks to the larger narrative going on in streaming Netflix has been notorious when it comes to spending money and now they need to make sure that they're getting the most bang for their buck ultimately so interesting development we'll see we were just talking about how you get into the preview club that's what I want to know I want to know what you need to do to get into I am the I am definitely not going to be in this preview club. <laughs> wait, I, if I was in the preview club, Netflix will have to wait like three years in order for me to review one series. But I think it would be interesting to know how they do. And apparently they provide employees with screeners and they okay. judge how quickly employees binge certain things uh, to, to determine what will have be, be a hit and what they potentially need to change. I'm picking yeah. this one over this one. Oh, any day. You haven't Anyone seen a movie in the me. theater since Pre -COVID, Although I did you're see out. Don't Look Up from She saw Netflix. Don't Look Up. It's <laughs> literally the only movie she's seen in five years. I didn't, I didn't love it, but it was funny. Other that than Paw Patrol. Too, on repeat. Yeah, and Paw Patrol. Any children, <laughs> yes. we'll, we'll put you on the children. I'm, yeah, I'm well versed in that. <laughs> um, Netflix also releasing a clip of the uh, Harry and Meghan Markle docuseries. Mm. I'm, I'm trying to pretend I'm excited for that. <laughs> what are the expectations, though, for these two? Oh, gosh. I think the expectations are high, just considering how well The Crown does, this fascinating with the royal family, in particular the fascination with Harry and Meghan. These two, of course, did sign a multi-year deal with Netflix in September 2020. It was reported to be valued at around $100 million, and this is on top wow. of all of their other deals. They have memoirs, books, a Spotify deal, so they're clearly establishing a business and a brand outside of the royal family. And as we were just talking about with Netflix, content is king, and now maybe content can also be a prince for the company. Well done. There we go. Oh, I've been dying to say it on this show. I'm like 50 50 Are you gonna watch land. it? I the trailer is very moody. It is. It's very mysterious. You just saw it was shot in black and white. I am pretty curious about it. But we've been inundated with a lot of Harry and Meghan these yeah, days. Yeah, I think I'll give this one a but shot. I think it's an it's easy one to put on in the background yeah. and watch. So. You don't look like you're convinced. Like he's, he's not excited. No <laughs> chance. You have a lot of time to kill on the train. You know, never <laughs> say never. All right, Ali Canal, <laughs> thanks so much for that. We've got to keep it moving here in Yahoo Finance. Coming up next, we are counting down to the closing bell on Wall Street. Still looking at losses for the Dow. Now off over 200 points. We'll be right back.
Just over a minute from the closing bell. Jared Blickery here at the big board to break down some of today's moves. Hey, Jared. Hey there. So we got the Nasdaq just barely in the green. Uh, S&P 500 just a little bit in the red. Dow about, down about half a percentage point. Guess what? The Nasdaq, if it does close in the green here, kind of going to be a nail biter. It would be the best highest close since September. So about two months there. XLC, that's communication services. That is in the forefront, but only up about six tenths of a percent, just a shadow of what it put in yesterday. Healthcare, tech, materials, industrials, consumer discretionary, all of those on the top line there. Let's take a look inside the NASDAQ so we can see. Let's put this on a two-day view. That really takes into consideration those big moves that we had from yesterday. Only down uh, strikes. We have our crowd strike. That's down about 10 percent. Costco down about 5 percent. Those are earnings stories stories right there. And let's take a look at a two-day view of the Dow as well, where we see only JP Morgan and 3M slightly in the red. Uh, tech and the mega caps have had a decent two-day run here, as we were talking about. Even some of those meme stocks got a little love today. Here's your closing bell on Wall Street. There is your closing bell on Wall Street. Let's check out how the market is finished on this Thursday. The Dow down about 190 points. The S&P 500 just about even, but you know, sneaking into the red there by three points. The Nasdaq, the only in the green, up just narrowly 14 points. Let's talk about all of this with Kevin Nicholson, Riverfront Investment Group, Global Fixed Income Chief Investment Officer, and Christian Ledoux, Director of the Investments at Cap Trust. Good to see you both. Christian, we'll start with you. Your read of really the last two days, as, as Jared just did there, kind of got to lop them in, giving that massive reaction to the Fed words. Oh, gosh. Uh, I, I and a lot of people out there are tired of the Fed. <laughs> I've got Fed fatigue. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're, we're always trying to predict what they're meaning with their verbs, uh, words and their releases and then on the press that they when they talk and it's getting very complicated. But I think we're getting closer to the point where we can stop thinking about the Fed. They're finally acknowledging that they're close to the top, if not there real soon. Um, and then we can start talking about corporate earnings, which is what's going to really matter next year. Kevin, what do you think? Do you agree? I think that the well, I think that the Fed is not done hiking. I think mm -hmm. that the market actually uh, has overreacted um, in the last day, especially the bond market. The bond market is pricing in more of a recession. Uh, and while credit markets are basically telling you just the opposite that you're going in a growth cycle. And I think that the Fed is, uh, you know, from yesterday, the Fed, and Powell said that we may get rates higher than uh, we expected for the terminal rate. So I think that the market has reacted a little uh, in the wrong direction, in my opinion. Christian, Kevin makes a good point, though, about the bond market. What is it telling you? Well, what I look at in a 10-year Treasury, which is really where that inversion is the most steep, is that's where the market believes the interest rates should be. Uh, we are seeing the big fat part of the short end, which is where the, the Fed is indicating it's going, at least in the short run. And that's that's being forced there by the Fed. If we do indeed see inflation continue to roll down, which we're already seeing that in the current data, uh, the, the Fed's going to react at some point in the next year or two. I don't know how long they're going to keep rates up, but then they'll, they'll start trending down towards that 10 year rate and you'll see a, a, a much flatter curve. Kevin, we heard Christian quickly mention uh, earnings that they were going to be the focus here moving forward. In terms of your expectations, Kevin, we had J.P. Morgan cutting its 2023 S&P earnings forecast by 9%. Are you revising your forecast lower? At this point, we have uh, not revised it lower. I mean, we think that next year we'll see roughly about $227 worth of earnings, which is pretty much in line with consensus at the moment. Uh, I think that you're going to have uh, expectations have been lowered, and I think that there may be some surprises. I think the big thing that we're going to have to watch going into next year is going to be profit margins. Will profit margins continue to uh, stay high or will they come down? And how many firms will have pricing power? I think that's, that's the big thing that's going to drive earnings um, in 2023. 
And Christian, I know you wanted to weigh in there. You said that is what truly matters. In addition to the JPM uh, trimming by 9%, they also said we could retest the S&P lows of 34.91. So your thoughts on earnings and Q123, where we could see the S&P headed. Yeah, I don't think we go to new lows. I would certainly agree that we've gone a long way in the short run, maybe a little too far too fast. Uh, what I what I would think is going to play out is a lot of the companies that have what's going to likely be much lower earnings next year have already come down a lot in price. I'm thinking about industries like home builders and a company that we own in our portfolios, HP Inc., which uh, is already uh, doing some layoffs to offset the, the downturn that they're likely going to see. And it's already baked into the stock prices. So it's the industries that are going to get through this with, uh, as Kevin said, pricing power, that'll hold up earnings on that end. And then the ones that are seeing the, the earnings declines that are likely gonna happen that has been very well foreseen, uh, the, the stock's are already down to reflect that. Kevin, we've heard from a number of retailers. We're waiting for Ulta to come out here any minute. Dollar General was out before the bell. We've had a number of uh, other companies here report a gap, Urban Outfitters, over the last week or two. When you try to gauge the consumer, the strength that we're seeing there, are you confident that we'll see the consumer remain resilient here as we head into the new year? The consumer has the ability to be uh, remain uh, resilient for a little while longer. And the reason for that is because during the pandemic, they were able to uh, fix their balance sheets. And even if savings has come down, uh, as we've seen, they have the uh, a clear balance sheet to be able to have access to credit. So you will probably see credit cards uh, balances go up. And, but as long as the, the consumer can meet those payments, I think that you will see the consumer uh, hang in there for a while longer. Yeah, credit balance is uh, rising faster than we've seen in 20 years. You mentioned HP. Uh, you have a couple other names for us, Christian, starting with Lowe's. Why? Well, Lowe's has a number of things going for it. Uh, when people can't buy the house that they would like to upgrade into because mortgage rates have gone up so much, what do they do? They upgrade their existing house. Uh, so that makes the home improvement group a little bit more recession resistant. And we like Lowe's versus Home Depot for a couple of reasons. Uh, it's, first of all, trading at four PE turns cheaper than a Home Depot. And second, uh, Lowe's has made a concerted effort to attract the pro-consumer by having some membership and uh, recurring uh, messaging with their professional customers. And that's starting to gain a little bit of share in Home Depot's uh, very profitable segments. Kevin, when you, try, when you try to gauge just the biggest risk to the market right now, to the investor out there, you mentioned the fact that you thought it was a bit of an overreaction, the reaction that we did see investors give the Fed and Jay Powell yesterday. What do you, I guess, what's your assessment just in terms of where you're seeing the biggest risk potentially for the coming months? The biggest risk is that if you think about what the Fed needs to do, the Fed's goal right now is to tighten financial conditions. And financial conditions have actually been easing over the last month. And so I think the biggest risk that the markets and investors face right now is a bit of a whipsaw. Um, because if, they, if the Fed continues to see financial conditions uh, loosen, then they're going to actually end up tightening monetary policy more. And that may mean further rate hikes. And that is a, that could be the potential uh, risk that hasn't been um, factored into uh, the markets at this point. Certainly, certainly something important to keep in mind. Kevin Nicholson, Christian Ledoux, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, guys. Some breaking news now out of Washington. The Senate voting to avert a rail strike, but rejecting legislation to increase paid sick leave for those rail workers. Yahoo Finance's Danny Romero joins us with the details. Danny, what are we learning? Uh, well, this is not good. And just on background, I just got off, a phone, off the phone with a union representative that says that this will actually put a, will grow, will cause a growing pressure because now the unions didn't get what they wanted. The Senate voted against this bill of paid sick leave. The final score was 52 yes. 43 no and 60 voted voted uh, they needed 60 votes to pass excuse me um, but two other bills were passed um, a deal that included a deal to block the railroad strike and and again this now means that the union has one a day of personal personal leave 
no sick day leave days, but it's worth noting that in Biden's tentative deal, there's a big loophole. And that goes back to the medical leave care aspect, which requires them to, if they are gonna go on medical leave, they can only take days off on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and they need to have 30 day notice. So again, this is not very good for the unions because they did not get what they wanted. It's going to cause possibly some work stoppages. I mean, they'll probably slow down. That's what I've been hearing from experts that it could cause that, that they might, you know, say, hey, you know, call call in, say, you know, I'm not going to come in or things like that. But again, they can be easily replaced now, uh, now that these bills are going to move forward and they have to get to the president's desk now. Dan, are there any options left on the table just in terms of what the unions could potentially do in the future to push for more sick paid leave? Well, uh, from what I'm hearing is that this uh, it's a five year agreement ag agreement and they have three years uh, to retract. So that means they'll be back to the negotiating table in two years. So essentially, yes, they didn't get what they wanted, um, but they will be go back, going back to the negotiating table right now. But again, it also brings this, you know, another topic of, you know, now that Bi the Biden administration has a heavy hand in this, you know, Biden, the Biden administration runs the risk of possibly losing pro-union support now. Um, yes and no. I mean, where are the unions going to go, right? They're probably not going to run to the right here in 24. Maybe turnout is impacted. And at the end of the day, they got a 24% pay raise. How many Americans, how many unions but it's not negotiated about that? But it wasn't about that, though. They really wanted the quality of life balance, which we essentially, us workers as well, want uh, too. So, you know, I mean, you want to get paid for your sick days too, right? Or when your son or your daughter gets sick, I'm sure you want to be able to say, hey, you know what, I can't, I can't, I can't come into work today. I got to stay home. Yeah. So, you know, and there are, they were our frontline workers as well. We, there are essential workers. I take the train. Dave, do you take the train? I sure do. Two hours, hours a day. Each day. day. <laughs> yeah. 10 hours a week. Yeah, but it was, I guess it was a slight win for the group, but not the full win that they That they are essentially, but. Get. And essentially, you know, they are going to go back to the negotiating table in two years. So, I mean, yes, there is some stake now, like I said, that they could be causing some form of a stoppage, obviously not a big stoppage, but they, they will, they could be easily replaced too. But again, you know, they also will need workers. So if you do have the, you, who are, who's going to replace them, yeah. essentially? Yeah, we will see how this all plays out. All right, Danny Romero, thanks so much for jumping on here for that breaking news. Coming up next, a check on consumer and retail earnings. Ulta earnings hitting the tape right now. We'll have that for you when we come back. And gas prices continuing to fall along with oil prices. The next key level to watch straight ahead.
Gas prices continuing to tumble. The national average for a gallon of regular gasoline is $3.47, down two cents from yesterday, though still higher than a year ago. This means, though, prices are now lower than they were on February 24th. Why does that matter? That's when Russia invaded Ukraine, causing oil prices to spike. A rather remarkable achievement, really, when you think about that war showing no signs of ending anytime soon. Meanwhile, we're starting to see diesel prices fall. A gallon of diesel cost $5.15, down about 16 cents from a month ago, but still well above the $3.64 it was one year ago. Shauna. I right, have Ulta earnings right now crossing the wires, and you can see the reaction in the stock up just about 3%. A lot of that reaction has to do with the guidance that we are getting from Ulta, the company boosting their full year outlook here, full year net sales guidance. Now expecting to see net sales of $9.95 billion to $10 billion. Initially, they saw $8.5 billion to $8.6 billion. The company also raising its full year operating margin estimate here. We're seeing that reflected in the stock after hours, adjusted EPS for the quarter, 534. That was a beat in terms of what the street was expecting. Revenue of $2.34 billion, also slightly better than what analysts were looking for. For more on this, we want to bring in Jessica Ramirez, Jane Haley and Associates, a senior research analyst. Jessica, it's great to see you. It certainly seems like investors are encouraged by these results. I know you've only had a few minutes to dig into this report, but what's your initial <laughs> takeaway? I mean, it's definitely a colorful stock, isn't it? I think, you know, when you look at Ulta, Ulta has, do, has been doing very well in this year compared to some of the other retailers, retail stocks, just because the beauty category has been very strong. And I think it's a resilient category that we continue to see throughout the year. The consumer has various reasons to shop beauty and a loan from beauty being a, a great category at the moment. Ulta has also been a very modern retail, very modern retailer with a very modern retail strategy in place, which again is future proof for when times are difficult and other retailers again are having difficulty with other parts of the business, you know, either too much inventory or promotions. They've been running a very clean promotional business in Q3. It was pretty much flat from our data that we pulled. Um, and overall, I mean, digital omni-channel, the stores are looking great. The conversations they have with Target, the partnership there is also great. So there's it's quite a strong uh, retailer at the moment. Indeed it is, up 14% this year, outperforming just about, yeah. frankly, everything on the planet. You talked about Target. How have <laughs> partnerships really built the Ulta that we see today? Well, I think partnerships in general, so you have two sides of it, right? Where you have this great partnership with Target, which we've seen do very well, and they've been able to manage it well because Target itself, the beauty category, has been very special, and they brought in a lot of these young brands and things like that. So it's done a very, it's complements each other on, on each side. You know, you're able to get this consumer into Target, discover these new brands that maybe Ulta has that Target may not have. So that's, I think, quite beautiful. And also, the beauty business changed very differently at, sim at the same time where in apparel we had the drop model. And that was basically new collaborations coming in to create hype and momentum with the with the consumer. And then there was these unique collaborations that would come through retail doors, again, to have that consumer come in only to your door because it was exclusive. So beauty started doing a lot of that and also started catching on quite some time ago. And I thought that was absolutely great. I think one of the biggest ones that, you know, that we commonly see is the Kylie Cosmetics they also was the first one to secure that. Mm -hmm. So we've seen them do a lot of these unique collaborations. Again, it gets the customer excited, especially Gen Z. In the quarter, they had collaborations with Disney. They had the one with Lisa Frank. You know, these very exciting things. So I think that's part of the winning formula. And again, of a modern retail strategy that we do expect, especially by now, that retailers have caught on to and really take that to the next level. Yeah, well, the results here boosting Ulta Beauty to an all-time high. Jessica, when you take a look at the floor plan, or really, I guess, the brick-and-mortar uh, side of things when it comes to Ulta, adding new stores, 18 new stores in the third quarter, plans to add more in the current quarter and looking ahead to 2023. Does that strategy make sense to you when we know more and more people are shopping online? Yeah, so I, it does make sense. And I think the argument of, you know, are you in-store or are you online, I think what we have to remember is, the consumer doesn't necessarily see what we talk about omni-channel. The consumer sees, is my shopping experience seamless? Can I be at work and pick this up easily? I might buy something in the store while I'm there. Am I just shopping online because I'm watching something and, oh, look, she looks great with that makeup. Maybe I can find that for myself. I can go on the app. 
that's just the way consumers shop today. So if there is a store, it's a medium format. It's a format that engages you. Ulta's also going a lot into services, which I noticed just quickly diving in. It was a quick, um, a small increase of 1% service, but they've been trying to increase those services. And when you go online, there's so many more that you can do. There's eyebrows, there's eyelashes, there's makeup, there's hair, there's just, you know, more and more growing. And so they're really trying to engage with that consumer, have that sticky feeling in the store and a reason for the, for them to trust them more and to stay within, within that, that space. So yes, we do need the store. Again, if it's not a huge store and we're not having too much inventory, I think it's great. They're also coming up with this new format that's more of a curated version of, you know, this is my makeup for X, Y, Z, rather than having the prestige and the mask sit in different parts of the store, which again, I think it's a great way to engage with the customer a lot more. Sounds rather recession proof there. CEO Dave Kimball highlighting the strong emotional connection and loyalty they've cultivated with their guests. That we are seeing in the numbers. Jane Haley and Associate Senior Research Analyst Jessica Ramirez, appreciate that, good stuff. Sticking with retail, it's still a hot time of year to do some tech shopping ahead of the holidays. Dan Howley here with some tips on what to look for when buying a new TV. Dan, I am in the market. I am paying full attention to this. Oh, all right, cool. Uh, I love TVs. Uh, my buddy just bought a 77-inch television. That's a big room. It's not. It's in an apartment in Queens. Oh, wow. boy. So he's going to live inside the TV. And uh, <laughs> let's just uh, run down some of the things that you need to know uh, when you go to buy a TV. First of all, uh, let's look at uh, some of these specs. Size is probably... The first one, my buddy did not take that into account. Uh, you want to make sure that when you're getting a TV, it's the right size for your space. You don't want to be too close. You don't want to be too far. Uh, and if you're far away, you don't want to have like a 40 inch screen and then it's, everything looks like ants. Uh, but you also don't want to be watching, I don't know, like Spider-Man and feel like he's going to attack you in your living room. Um, that's not what he does, but maybe he would. Uh, the other thing is type. There are two different main types of TVs out there. There's OLED and LCD. Most of the ones on the market are LCD. That's fine. You're probably watching this on an LCD, but if you really want the best picture, you should go with OLED. OLED basically allows for pure blacks, uh, which means you're gonna get perfect color. Uh, you'll get uh, anything that's in kind of like a darkened room. It's not gonna have that, oh, why is this uh, fuzzy in this area? It's going to look perfectly black. Then you'll have a nice uh, kind of flow to the colors around it. Uh, also, brighter colors will look even better. Everything pops a lot more. Uh, HDR. That is high dynamic range. You'll see that on a lot of TVs now. Uh, you know, LCD, OLED, it has it. Uh, OLED is gonna have it regardless, uh, just because as I said, it's able to produce those beautiful, vibrant colors. If you're getting an LCD, make sure that it has HDR capabilities. Number of ports you want, you need HDMI, get four. Trust me, I don't care if you don't need four right now, get them. Refresh rate, the higher the better. And price, like anything you can get, that's, I would say, a little under a thousand. For a great TV, I'm talking. That's good. I picked mine up for 1200. It's a 65 inch LG C1 OLED. Mm. That sounds nice. I have no idea the size of my TV. Oh my God. When you were talking, Actually, I was like, I, it I could be either. 40 inch. It could be, six. I have no idea. Oh, 65 is the way to go. 77? I don't, I don't crazy, live crazy. in a big You enough can house close your eyes and think inches. this man is talking about a fine bottle of Cabernet. Uh, yeah. Right? That's yeah. usually what's next to me in front of the TV. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. And Holly, great stuff. <laughs> wow. All right. Coming up, a financial influencer promoted FTX to his nearly 2 million subscribers, tells us what to make of Sam Bank and Freed's downfall and, well, just pathetic display the last 24 hours on television.
The war against woke capitalism continues to rage. The latest battle between Florida governor and likely Republican presidential candidate Ron DeSantis and BlackRock CEO Larry Fink. The prize, a $2 billion investment. Senior columnist Rick Newman here with how this fight has ended for now. Hey, Rick, what's the latest from DeSantis? Well, Florida says it's going to pull $2 billion in assets, and this is some money that's in retirement funds, and they have to find somebody to invest that money. So that money is at BlackRock, the giant investing firm. And they say they're going to take that out because they don't agree with, uh, with BlackRock's ESG focus, the environmental, social, and governmental guidance uh, that, uh, that BlackRock operates by. But it's unclear what they're going to do with that money. I mean, are they going to look around for some other uh, finance firm or investing firm that um, you know, has a invest in the sin industry or something like that? You know, are you only going to invest in oil companies, gun manufacturers and booze and cigarette companies? I, I, I'm not sure I get where this is going. Um, and Florida is not by any means pulling all of its money out. That $2 billion is a, um, a small part of all the uh, funds that uh, Florida has in its retirement savings account. And it's not a huge hit for BlackRock either. I did the math on this. BlackRock has uh, $10 trillion in assets under management and Florida is taking out $2 billion. Um, so that adds up to uh, about 0.2% of BlackRock assets that they're going to lose on this. But we're going to hear a lot more about this, be but because Republican thinks th Republicans think they can gain political leverage by going after big companies that are a little too socially correct for them. And Larry Fink had some headlines at the uh, deal book New York Times. Somebody yesterday actually believed we're going to need hydrocarbons for 70 years. He also said, quote, I believe stakeholder capitalism is not political, not woke. It is capitalism. We'll see how that resonates. Rick, do you think other states, Republican led, obviously, will follow here? Yeah, there are a couple others that have already done this. Uh, I think Louisiana has done it. I think you'll find uh, some other uh, states that have done this. But I think it's just going to add up to small potatoes because I, I don't really see what alternatives uh, any uh, any uh, anybody who has this kind of money to invest um, really, really has. And uh, I, BlackRock says, look, you can't say you want to take your money away from us because our returns are poor. Our returns are excellent. And uh, th there is a case to be made that uh, applying a certain amount of ESG focus actually uh, improves returns. Now, there's a lot of debate on that, and it's going to go on. Um, but there, there was an effort to capitalize on this. There was a bank in Texas uh, that tried to set up and, and, and carve, it, carve out some space here and say, we're the anti-woke lender. Um, you can bank with us if you don't like the way uh, big banks operate. And they went bust about three or four weeks ago. So I'm not sure how solid that market is. Yeah, this is right up Governor Abbott's alley indeed. Senior columnist Rick Newman here with that good stuff, my friend. Thank you. See you, Dave. Among the many gems mined by Sam Bankman Fried in the last 24 hours regards telling the truth. Quote, I was as truthful as I'm knowledgeable to be. I can't wait for my teenagers to take that one for a spin. Here with reaction, Kevin Paffrath. You know him as Meet Kevin on YouTube, where he once pushed FTX to his more than 1.8 million subscribers. Kevin, good to see you. First, let's start with George Stephanopoulos asking SBF about what he makes of the frequent Bernie Madoff comparisons. I want your reaction. Listen. I don't think that's who I am at, at all, but 
I understand why they're saying that. People lost money, and people lost a lot of money. When you look at the classic Bernie Madoff story, there was no real business there. The whole thing, as I understand it, I think, was, was just one, one big Ponzi scheme, right? FTX, that was a real business. So Kevin, I want your general reaction to SBF on both these interviews, and I'm gonna give you a multiple choice. Is he Bernie Madoff? Is he Elizabeth Holmes? Or is he Billy McFarlane minus the cheese sandwich, AKA Firefest? Uh, you know, I don't know, man. He is a, a little bit of all three of the above, mostly a big a cluster of a disaster. And thank you, first of all, for having me. But look, even if you have inexperience, you can't be negligent with customer funds. And everyone was duped by this business. And it wasn't because it was a bad business. It was because it was managed terribly. And I think that's what this comes down to is I don't actually believe that Sam Bankman Fried meant to defraud people. He just did by being negligent. And that's almost as bad. So hey, would I rule out Sam Bankman Fried hanging out with Bernie Madoff? Maybe not, because, uh, you know, maybe he deserves to. So there's finally a message that's sent to not only Wall Street, but everybody in the crypto community that if you screw up and you lose people's money doing stuff you say you're not doing, like protecting people's assets, you deserve to be in prison. Well, Kevin, I guess, what have you learned? Because you had a partnership with FTX. You have 1.8, nearly 2 million subscribers to your YouTube channel, a lot of loyal followers, I'm sure, some of them were a little bit upset with you over the last couple of weeks. What have you heard from them? And I guess the biggest lesson that you personally have learned from this. Yeah, personally, the biggest lesson that I've learned is I just can't trust external companies. When you've got massive hedge funds like Sequoia or uh, people like Kevin O'Leary saying the safest place to put your money is FTX, Boy, oh boy, I say to my audience, hey, if you want to speculate a little bit on crypto and maybe a small portion of your portfolio, FTX is a great platform. I said that. I regret that. I wish I could go back and undo that because now that's a scar on me as an influencer. Now people are like, well, I mean, you had a partnership with them, so it looks bad. What I do now is, and, and after this, what I've decided is I've said, you know what? I'm just not going to do partnerships anymore with anything other than what I create. So if I have a real estate startup, which I do, it's called House Hack, uh, or a stock startup or whatever it is, like my ETF, then, then I can promote my own products. But I'm not going to promote anybody else's products anymore because you've got people like Sam Bankman-Fried who say – Everything's fine. Don't worry about it one day. And the very next day, they freeze customer withdrawals and it's terrible. So understandably, so some of the folks who follow me, hopefully they still do, are upset. Uh, many of them fortunately watched my warning videos and tweets that I sent at least a, a week before the collapse and said, look, the collapse is starting at FTX, the international division. It's going to spread to the U.S. one get out as soon as possible. So many folks send me thank you letters and saying thanks for the warning. The problem is not everybody was able to watch that week. What if they were on vacation and they came back and oh my gosh, it's collapsed. It's terrible. And, and I, I think the buck ultimately stops with Sam Bankman Freed. And at bare minimum, he was criminally negligent and deserves to serve time since he can't serve money since he's bankrupt. Yeah, he's, he's probably going to do some considerable time. And you acknowledge you were paid $2,500 per mention of FTX. Given that relationship, how difficult is it to build, or in this case, rebuild trust as you are starting your own ETF? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, our ETF, the Pricing Power ETF, ticker PP, just launched yesterday. We're very excited about that. Uh, we hope it uh, goes very strong. Uh, the assets go up over time. But ultimately, uh, I, I just have to put one foot in front of the other. You know, we go through life and we get scarred. This FTX thing is a scar, and I've apologized for it. I've changed what I do going forward, which is not working with external companies anymore. I'm just going to work on things I control. That way, if we do something wrong, at at least we can fix it. But we don't expect to do things wrong to the level of an FTX because that's criminally negligent. I work with the SEC and regulations. I see what we have to go through. And honestly, what it does is it shows, wow, being a licensed Series 65 financial advisor, I see why the regulation is in place, why there are audits, why there are systems and controls. It's to prevent an FTX. It's all there for a reason. And the SEC is doing a great job, or, or at least the best that they can, 
And that's why we need an SEC for crypto. This is exactly why we need regulation to prevent this kind of disaster from happening again in the future. Kevin, more on that regulation, because I think everything, everyone's trying to figure out what exactly that should look like, how quickly we will see regulation. What do you think about that? Yeah. Yeah, well, first and foremost, we need uh, essentially either the SEC or an institution like the SEC to regulate the brokerages so that we know the exchanges are actually safe where people can deposit their money. Ideally, we need SIPC insurance, which you have at brokerages like Robinhood or M1 Finance or TD Ameritrade. You're insured up to $500,000 against loss if the brokerage goes bust. It's kind of like an FDIC insurance, which is usually for savings and checking accounts. That's the first thing we need. People need to have faith that their institution or money in an institution is going to be protected. That also prevents a bank run, which could lead those brokerages to collapse in the first place. But we didn't have that at FTX. Of course not, because it's unregulated. Then people need to trust the actual things they're buying, which are probably securities in many cases. Some say maybe Bitcoin isn't. But whatever you call coins, there should be some form of regulated process for making sure these coins are actually legitimate uh, and that they've had some form of regulatory vetting process. Now people can exchange in a marketplace they trust with insurance and government backstops, and they can actually purchase things that have at least been vetted. See, the SEC says the goal is not to help you make a good investment. The goal is to help you make a fair investment. So you should be free to make good or bad investments, but all investments should be fair and free from fraud. And that's the goal of regulation. And I 100% support regulation and it can't come soon enough. All right. So you mentioned your ETF. It is ETF, excuse me. It is one fifth Tesla, 36% Tesla and Apple. The big short investor, Danny Moses, joined us earlier this week. He is short on Tesla, admittedly, and he lays out his reasons right here. Listen. And I believe that Tesla is the one company that represents, to me, everything that's been wrong in terms of valuation, capital markets, and it's the king of the meme stocks. I think over time, we'll start to see earnings degrade. And I just can't understand how people don't question more about his operating expenses. You're building gigafactories in Berlin and Austin, Yet, and you want to produce more cars, yet as a percentage of sales, they don't seem to track accordingly. So something's up there. If your ETF does well, Danny has to be wrong. Why is he? Hey, well, we'll see. But uh, look, I mean, no disrespect for anybody. I think Danny could brush up on the research a little bit for Tesla. In fairness, look, the operating expenses for Tesla are growing because they are building two new factories, but they're producing free cash flow in excess of $2 billion in just the last quarter. We expect free cash flow to exceed $10 billion within the next year on $116 billion of sales. That's phenomenal free cash flow. In addition to that, you've got a company that's trading for about 45 times 2023 earnings right now. They're growing at a 45 to 50% pace. When you divide those two, you get a number right around one for the peg ratio. That's how you value companies growth with a peg ratio. That's how we do it. And what we're looking at is the valuation of Tesla on the basis of peg, very reasonable around one, if anything, it's low. When you look at companies like Apple or Google, you start getting more expensive. You're in the one and a half to two, per, uh, two range, two multiple range. And therefore, we think Tesla's a phenomenal deal. And the reason we have the allocation as high as we do at 23% is because we think there is a possibility, not guarantee, obviously, but we think there's a possibility Tesla could double in the next year alone. And then what we'll do is we will pare down the allocation to Tesla and diversify out of it. Because of the tax benefits of an ETF, we uh, don't actually expect uh, to pass many of those uh, capital gains along to investors. That's one of the benefits of an ETF, but people should Google those or talk to their CPA. Well, Kevin, Tesla stock is off 44% this year. More people on Wall Street, more analysts coming out saying that Twitter has been a massive distraction for Elon Musk. It's a risk here for Tesla going forward as Musk does focus on Twitter. Morgan Stanley, uh, Morgan Stanley's Adam Jonas was one of those analysts that come out and said that. Well, Bush's Dan Ives has also said something similar in recent weeks. How big of a risk do you see Twitter being to Tesla's success? Yeah, Twitter right now has a beautiful uh, aspect of it going on for its investors. And that is that Tesla is the hedge for Twitter. If Twitter has problems and Elon Musk needs more money, he sells Tesla stock. 
He said it himself. His actions have said it himself. It's not a secret and it sucks for Tesla, but it's a short term buying opportunity for Tesla because guess what happens when Twitter actually starts functioning? Even what we saw with Elon Musk meeting Steve Jobs in person to clear the tension between the two. Brilliant move, by the way, by Tim Cook. Guess what happens? All of a sudden, once that Twitter overhang goes away, Tesla's off to the races. And your last analyst talked about EPS downgrades and a potential recession. Guess who probably won't have EPS downgrades? Tesla, no matter the recession. We will see. All right, Kevin Pathrath, great to have you on. Thanks so much for joining us this Thank afternoon. You. All right, well, coming up, ex-Theranos executive Suni Balwani is due to be sentenced next week. We will tell you how much jail time prosecutors want him to serve when we come back. Ex-Theranos President Ramesh Sunny Balwani is awaiting sentencing after being convicted of fraud. Now we know how much jail time prosecutors want him to serve. Alexis Keenan is here with the answer. Alexis, how long? Hi, Dave. So 15 years is what the government is recommending to the judge. Remember, Balwani is Elizabeth Holmes' co-defendant and also her former boyfriend who served as CEO of Holmes' blood testing company, Theranos. Now, the recommendation comes on the heels of Elizabeth Holmes' own sentence. That happened on November 18th. And for Holmes, the government made that same 15-year recommendation for a prison term, though the judge ultimately decided that her term would be 11 years and three months. Now, it was back in July when Balwani's jury returned guilty verdicts on all 12 counts of fraud that the government brought for his role in the blood testing company. And while both juries found that the Sil Silicon Valley biotech company fleeced investors out of hundreds of millions of dollars, it was Balwani's jury that delivered a much harsher verdict, but still the government asking for that same level of incarceration here. Now, technically, each of these 12 convictions that Balwani uh, is looking at, they each carry a maximum penalty of 20 years in prison and also $250,000 in fines plus millions of dollars in restitution. Uh, but for his part, Balwani, he's asking for straight probation. He thinks he should not go to jail at all. Uh, but like 
like with Holmes, Dave, this decision is up to the judge that presided over both cases. Belwani will learn of his sentence on December 7th when he's scheduled to be back in court. Uh, but as with Holmes as well, we should also expect to see an appeal from Belwani. Guys? Indeed we will. Alexis Keenan, great stuff. Thank Alexis you. Keenan, great stuff. Thank you. Coming up, if you want that Big Mac and you want it now, find out how McDonald's plans to get you your food even faster. Let's take a look at some of the trending after hours stickers for you. We have three today. We have Ulta Beauty, Marvel Technology, and Zscaler. Let's kick it off with Ulta Beauty. You're looking at gains of just around 3%. The company reporting earnings earlier in the hour, boosting their full year net sales guidance, 9.95 billion to 10 billion is now what they're expecting. The company also boosting its full year profit guidance. Third quarter results reflect, quote, sustained resilience of the beauty category. That's what executives said in this earnings release. Over the past three months, the company's done relatively well, up just around 11% year to date. We are now looking at gains, look at that, up just about 14%, bucking the downward trend that we have certainly seen in the broader markets this year. Let's move on to Marvel Technology, a big mover here after hours, now off just about 6%, so pairing some of those earlier losses in extended trading. Third quarter profit missed expectations revenue. Also coming in a bit light, fourth quarter net revenue guidance did miss what the street was looking for. Inventory reductions, this is what the company is saying, impacting some of the near term results. Over the past three months, the stock just in the red off about 1% over the last six months. You're looking at losses of about 21%. Rounding it out with Zscaler, the cloud security company, that stock off nearly 10% in after hours trading. Full year calculated billings forecast was lagging the street's estimates, and that is why we're off nearly 10%. When you take a look at the current quarter numbers, it actually looked relatively well for its fiscal first quarter. The company beating on both the top and bottom line, but the guidance for its calculated build it billings. That is what's really dragging the stock lower. Past three months were essentially flat. Year-to-date, Zscaler 
off about 55%. Ooh, ouch. More than half the market cap. Thank you, Shauna. Good stuff. McDonald's is testing a new drive through lane for digital orders only. Brooke De Palma is here with the details of the test. Brooke, tell us how this thing works. That's right. Well, this is actually one of the first concepts. This is the first test by McDonald's in Fort Worth, Texas. Now, what's a little bit different here is the order ahead component of this new test restaurant design. And the order ahead technology allows customers to order on the app and then flag the restaurant team when that customer is approaching the restaurant, so then they can prepare that order. But other uh, parts of this new test restaurant design include kiosks, which already exist in many McDonald's restaurants, pickup shelves for orders, curbside order pickup, parking spaces for delivery drivers. And inside the restaurant, you're also gonna see food and beverage conveyors, conveyors that is, and a new kitchen format. Now the name of the game here and the focus is speed and accuracy. Now in the release, they said the franchise operating, uh, the franchise operator owner who is behind this test really said that he's hoping that the restaurant team is able to deliver big and faster and that the restaurant team can fulfill orders with more ease. Now, you guys know the McDonald's uh, has been really trying to bring about their Accelerating the Arches campaign for the past few years. That is developed on maximizing marketing. They're developing the core menu. So we've seen them sort of revisit those core menu items a lot over the past year without introducing new things. But really, the triple D's here, delivery, drive through and digital. They're continuously looking to up the ante there. Three D's. I like that there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's also going to be interesting whether or not this helps kind of alleviate some of the pressures that fast food companies like McDonald's, so many of its competitors have had with trouble attracting workers. There's been mm -hmm. worker shortages, which has been affecting the output of so many of these fast food companies. So you would think the integration of more technology will help them a little bit with this. Nothing here that was too revolutionary, though. I, I, it makes a lot of sense. I'm surprised it's taken McDonald's until now to implement some of these changes. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. It's like turning around a tanker. It's awfully big. You know, it's hard to make changes on the fly when your McDonald's <laughs> stock's up about 1.8% on the year. Good to see you, Brooke. Thank you. Up next, peanut butter and jelly, chips and salsa, Pepsi and milk. Stay tuned for this bubbly combination next. When your job is delivering presents to children around the world, caffeine is required. Pepsi has an idea how to caffeinate St. Nick and help them get the job done. Hashtag Pilk and Cookies. You see, Pepsi's chief marketing officer, Kevin Kaplan, says 
combining Pepsi and milk has long been a secret hack among Pepsi fans. Here's a look at their new campaign featuring Lindsay Lohan, which launches today. is one dirty soda, Santa. <laughs> <laughs> if Lindsay likes it, who doesn't? We have follow, a lot to live up to in our reaction. Follow Pepsi uh, on Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. Share your creation, and you can actually win some cash. Sean and I are not going to try this creation. We'll have to follow them and tag them as well. When we, we see will. Dirty soda has been a trend on TikTok for a couple of years. It has. But Over a million mentions, I think, on but TikTok But I don't as think well. this is exactly what we see on TikTok. No, a lot of times they have syrup, I believe, and other things that are added in, heavy cream, and it was one milk. I don't know how I feel. You're very excited for this. I'm a little skeptical. How much milk did you put uh, in? That's a pretty solid splash. So we went <laughs> 2% on the Pepsi, and here we go. Hmm. I don't Actually, see, not bad. I don't see anything wrong with the flavor. The only issue I have with it is I lose the carbonation of the Pepsi, which is really the reason I drink it. I like it's the bubbles. It's actually really good. The flavor's excellent. You know though. what, and you made this comparison during the break, and I'm gonna steal it from you. It does remind me oh. of the taste of if you were to have a root beer float or a soda with yeah. ice cream. It does have a very, very similar taste. I was pleasantly surprised. I thought it was going to be, just, but you're going all in. I'm going all in. This is an excellent combination. Our producers were a little skeptical, yeah. but uh, they're gonna have to come out here and try this. Mm. I actually like it. I don't know, so you dip the Oreo? Is that what, I guess I Santa. I think it was as a chaser in case we didn't like it, no? So I don't if know. Santa comes by, he's gonna dip the cookies in the yeah, and Pilk and Cookies. Mm -hmm. Pilk and Cookies is the hashtag, again, if you try to win some cash following Pepsi on Instagram, Twitter, or it's TikTok. It's decent. I don't think I would go home and make this by myself, but it was much better than I thought it would. I think everyone I'm gonna should try it. it. All right, well, you can do that. All right, well, while Dave finishes his drink, I'll think about doing that with mine. That does it for us today on Yahoo Finance Live. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you right back here again tomorrow afternoon. Have a great night.